my name is uh, Steve. I work at uh, Orbitz, hometown Chicago. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, a microservices uh, experiment that we did recently. Um, for those of you that don't know us, we're a travel website. If you used us to get in here, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with a quick, uh, very brief uh, architecture overview and history. We'll kind of talk about how we did a transition from sort of monolithic to services to microservices with Docker. Um, and, uh, and of course, you can't talk DevOps without talking about automated pipelines, and hopefully we'll have questions at the end. All right, so I'll start with the splash page, going back to the year 2000. Um, Orbit started by the major carriers. The goal was to create a single place to travel. And haha, -ha, yes, we're still hiring. Um, OK, bad conference joke out of the way. All right, so the architecture looks something like this, right? Standard 2000 architecture. You had your web layer. You talked to your business layer, which talked to the airlines. The website was launched in 2000 uh, with the, I think we still call it the Orbot. Um, we had one application. We did releases as needed. And what we, bas what we basically did alongside the likes of Expedia and Travelocity was we, we sort of brought travel to the customer, right? It became self-service. And uh, you, know, you didn't have to call this, this nice lady on the phone anymore when you wanted to go somewhere and have her type these cryptic commands into these uh, systems that were invented before I think most of us were born. Um, and uh, those boxes of paper tickets on the floor, those are gone. Uh, so th the thing that she was typing into is, uh, is called the Global Distribution System, or GDS. And so when, I, when we're talking about this picture, we're really talking about we, to communicate with the airlines, you, you talk to a GDS. And the first one we hooked up to was uh, a GDS called WorldSpan. They're still around. Um, and by the time uh, 2003 came around, we hooked up to our next GDS, uh, which was Sabre. Um, so we did this sort of thing, and this was sort of the financial incentive for, cre for creating orbits, was if we booked, let's say, an American Airlines ticket and we booked it in Sabre, it was actually cheaper for the airline. So that's kind of how the economics worked. And around the same time, American decided, hey, we got to get a website. Everybody else has a website. So we were happy to provide a, a business layer for them. Northwest kind of did the same thing. Um, you know, pretty soon we saw this, this kind of architecture wasn't going to scale. So in the 2004 time frame, we, uh, we, we switched to like a services model. And the idea here was that we'd have these nice tiny components that would have different release cycles, and um, they could evolve independently and be operated on by different teams. And this worked fine for a while. We hooked up to other uh, back ends. Uh, American eventually decided to connect to Sabre themselves. Northwest got bought by another carrier. We, Orbitz acquired other brands. American Express needed a booking engine, so we provided that to them. Um, anyway, there's a lot more history here. It's a 15-year-old company. I'm not going to show you everything, but you kind of get the idea, right? Your, your site is never really done, right? Everything you think you have today, it's always going to be evolving. This, this sort of idea that, oh, one day everything will be using this one thing and this one technology, and it'll just be blissful nirvana, never going to happen, right? So <clears throat> fast forward to today. We've got uh, multiple brands, um, web services. So like, for instance, if you search Kayak, they actually go through our web services, websites like Orbits and Orbits for Business and so on, communication with lots of back ends. The, the platform is now composed of uh, over 500 of these, these sort of service services uh, that are uh, running on thousands of instances. Um, and we do deployments more or less daily, right? Now, as you can imagine, <coughs> uh, applications that evolve over a decade tend to accrue process. Uh, this is a picture that Jacob, he's out here somewhere. Hey, Jacob. Um, he took a picture of this. This is, uh, this is somebody trying to sort of um, stitch out the, the path of, from code to production and all the steps it took. Now, if you need to use a, a panorama mode of your camera to <laughs> capture this, you, you are not DevOps, all right? Um, so uh, l things have improved a lot. You know, in 2010, I think we were doing maybe like four releases a year. You can imagine how well those went. By 2012, I think, which was around the time of this picture, I think we were about 18 days from code to production. Today, I'm happy to say it's closer to one to four days. Um, but in reality, it's really not going to get much better than that using sort of the, what we're doing today, right? Because um, the bottleneck is no longer uh, the technology. It's, it's the people in the process, right? And you, you sort of see this at, at Conway's Law at play. If you're not familiar with Conway's, it basically means that your, your software is organized around 
uh, the way your company is organized, right? And so this, this is kind of the roots of DevOps, right? Dev has their tool for deploying code, and operations has their tool. We switched to Chef um, maybe three years ago from CF Engine, thank God. And <clears throat> um, but what kind of happened was, you know, the pain and complexity around trying to get these two systems to like properly align and you know everything be happy made it so people stopped make, making new services. And so what wound up happening was they would just keep adding more and more to the services we had. And so now, 15 years later, instead of having one big giant application, we had hundreds of giant applications. Um, and they were all complicated, right? And so one day, somebody came along and said, hey, I have one of these giant applications. I want to break it apart, right? I want to I decompose this down into the 40 plus little subservices um, and I want to do it in Docker. I want to use, I want to do, you know, sort of 12-factor principles. I want simple configuration. Um, I want to package it all up in Docker. And it, it really the goal was I want to deploy this in minutes, right, not days, right? So this is, um, sorry about that. So this is Norbit's landing page. If you basically go to Google or something, you type Chicago Hotels, you're going to see something like this, right? This page is basically composed of what are called modules, right? The modules come from various data sources like databases or solar or other services that we have. And it kind of looks something like this, right? The web, the web layer talks to this content orchestration service. It calls all the various modules, composes a page together, and then returns it. Um, here we're showing three, but it's really like 40, and it's managed by like 10 teams. And so you can imagine, and, and this is all a Java app, right? You can imagine there's a lot of dependency hell going on here. Uh, lack of resiliency, you know, any one, any bug in any one module will basically just nuke the whole plat the whole, the whole service. Um, and you also had a really tight, um, you know, release schedule. Like you could only release on a certain day. And so you'd have lots of changes from lots of teams. And it was really hard to know when it broke, who broke it, right? Um, and so the idea was, well, let's take these, these, these modules and, and pull them out. And we'll make all this run in Docker. And um, like I said, use 12-factor principles, um, you know, and, and basically what this allowed was more team ownership, right? Every team was responsible for making the changes, doing the configuration, doing the deployments. Um, really what we wanted to do was trivialize the concept of a release, right? Because if you think about how we did it before, which was something like this, and you guys might do something like this, every time you check in code to your source, uh, your, your, uh, your source repository, You'd have a Jenkins job or something, kick off a, a snapshot build or a beta build, and you'd run some unit tests to make sure everything still looked okay, and then you basically throw it away. And you do this over and over again. Then Tuesday comes around or something, and it's like, hey, it's time for a release, and now you actually deploy it. And so this, this fear of actually deploying all those sort of intermediate things was, was really just creating this, um, this potential ba backlog of, of uh, you know, backlash when you actually deployed it to production. So in in, a, in this sort of DevOpsy continuous deployment, continuous integration world, every build is a release candidate, right? And so, what we, the, so basically the first thing we did was said, okay, well we're going to be deploying Docker apps. Uh, we could do a whole talk on this. Uh, we've actually done a whole talk on this, but um, basically this is like the node that we want to deploy our, our, our Docker apps, those little green apps. And kind of start from the bottom. We use we use Chef to basically provision the box, and it installs and configures Docker and some other companion services on the side, right? Like, oh, I can't I can't really log to Docker. I have to, you know, shoot those off somewhere. So we use things like Logstash to shoot those off. And uh, that black box is console. It's a eventually consistent service discovery that we use for um, the that service discovery between the orchestration service and the Docker containers. Um, and then over on the left, you see uh, I don't know. If, Familiar, but uh, at the top it's uh, Marathon, and the, that M thing is, is Mesos. We basically use uh, this combination of Marathon and um, Mesos to uh, deploy Docker containers across a farm of machines, basically, right? Um, so, but really, the deployment step looks like this, right? You have some step in your Jenkins pipeline that goes to Marathon and says, "Hey, launch this or upgrade this," and it basically just does it, right? Which kind of leads us to this continuous delivery business, right? And so what we really wanted, if we were going to do this sort of minimal touch point from, from people, uh, we wanted this idea that when you commit your code, 
uh, to the code repository, it, it's going to production, right? And so we, you needed some kind of gate, right? Security, security guys don't like it when you say, well, any developer can just kind of um, you know, make a change and push it to production because you know, they might be evil or something. And so, <clears throat> um, so you need some kind of oversight, right? You might want to run some automated tests before you actually uh, do this. And so we kind of adopted this, pu this pull request model, uh, the idea being that you know, when you um, fill out your pull request, that little merge button is, is grayed out. Somebody has to review it. You have some sort of minimal number of approvers. They can't merge it either. They can only approve it. And then you have this little robot come along and kind of do the merge. And, and then from this point on, everything's kind of, you know, you're commencing the, the, the pipeline to production, right? This is human free after this point. So the Jenkins pipeline um, is basically triggered by, so we use Atlassian Stash as our, as our internal Git repository. We have a, a Git hook that um, basically triggers the pipeline. There's sort of a, a build, you know, build and package the, uh, the Docker app and then some various deployment steps, um, as well as some uh, paper tickets for things like, um, you know, every change to production needs a, like a change ticket, right? Um, now, the other thing I'll mention that, oh wait, oh no, no. Okay, so this is, this is kind of a simplified pipeline, right? We, we really have like 20 environments, right? Some, when we deploy to production, we actually deploy to like six environments in parallel. Uh, so just to kind of keep it simple, it looks like this, right? You do your build, you do your unit test, you, you create your little Docker artifact, you push it to your local, um, your Docker repository. Uh, we deploy to a, a, a dev environment where we run some acceptance tests, some more deployments, eventually we open the paperwork try and deploy it to production, and then we either close the ticket, successful or not, right? Um, the build step kind of looks like this, right? You, you, the code itself internally contains like a version property file, and you know, this is mostly just, you know, you version it the way that it makes sense, right? Major, minor versioning. So in this case, it's like 1.2. Now, because every build is now a potential release candidate, uh, you really need to tag and version everything. So this idea of a, you know, a beta is just gone, right? Everything's a release. So we just use the Jenkins um, build number for that job, stick it on there, package the thing up in a Docker container now, right? Before, we would have just pushed this to our Maven repository and then had some other tool run by somebody else do the deployment when it was time. Now we package the thing up in a Docker container. This is a simple Spring Boot app, which is why it's just you know, java-jar. Um, package it up, and then we internally push it to our uh, Artifactory, which is our Maven repository. It does Docker too, but you know, for most people this would be either uh, you know, Docker Hub or um, Docker Private Registry, I forget what you guys call it. Um, and so the rest of the pipeline at this point is just gonna sort of pull down this Docker image, right? Everybody with me so far? Okay, now the one sort of change that we made along with this a little sidestep, is that in a traditional sort of Jenkins setup, you know, you have a, a Jenkins master and you have a bunch of, you know, slaves, and the slaves sort of have to have everything on it that you might possibly need. And we, we took a tip from um, an eBay blog post we found a while ago where they were using Mesos, and they basically did something like this. So when their Jenkins, um, when their Jenkins job or whatever gets triggered or by polling, decides it needs to do a build, Instead of having the static pool of masters it, or slaves, it would basically spin up an ephemeral slave, which would then connect back to the master, perform the build, and then publish your artifacts, right? And when you were done, you just kind of, you know, nuke the, nuke the slave. You don't know how long I wanted to use that stupid flame thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> how many years ago did that come out? All right, so uh, again, this is a, this, basically what this lets you do is it lets you create like smaller single purpose Jenkins slaves, right? One for building this, one for deploying that. Um, and so you, you kind of have these little micro deployment bits, right, as part of your, your Jenkins infrastructure. So there's a whole talk on this. I gave a talk of this last week at uh, Mesoscon. The video's not up. Um, but uh, it, I, I go through how to set all this up. It's, it's pretty interesting if you, you know, wanted to at least test out things like Docker and Mesos. This is a nice sort of safe, uh, self-contained way that doesn't affect your actual application too much. All right, so now that we've got the build done and we've got our Docker container, now comes the deploy step. Now, 
traditionally, when you are dealing with these sort of static deploys, right, you're moving it from environment to environment, and you need something to do the launch that's going to parameterize it, usually pass it as environment variables or whatever. But in this particular case, we're using that in a combination with Marathon, where I just say, launch this, and I want three, right? And Marathon, in conjunction with Mesos, will figure out where to put those, right? And so the deployment looks something like this, right? I pull down my playbook from source code. Um, Marathon, you can kind of think of Marathon as like init D for a bunch of boxes, right? It's very similar in a lot of ways to like Docker Swarm and, and, and things like that. Um, so the playbook will basically, so in this case I'm already running, let's say, version 1.216 of my application, and now I want to upgrade to 1.217. 1 so I basically make a call to Marathon saying, I want this new version of the code. And the call to Marathon is actually asynchronous. It just kind of returns a deployment ID. So because this is Jenkins pipeline and we want it to block, right, because you don't want it to go all the way to production before you actually see whether it was successful, we added a little bit of uh, Ansible logic here to sort of make it look um, synchronous. So the idea is you check with Marathon, is my application running? If it's not, you do a post. If it is, you do a put. And then you get this deployment ID back, and you just kind of pull for a while and wait for the deployment to finish. Um, now, at this point, Marathon interacts with Mesos, figures out where to deploy the stuff, deploys all the new versions. right? Um, when you deploy an application using Marathon, you can also give, a, give it a configurable health endpoint that it can check, see whether or not you were able to actually come up properly. Did you connect to your data sources? Right? Are you, are you OK to continue? Right? And if that happens, it basically then shuts down the old stuff. Otherwise, you, you would abort it, and it would, it would stick with the old version. Right? Um, so uh, this works great. And the really nice thing about this kind of setup is that even if you have, oh, so this is basically like one environment. So this was like dev, right? Now we do this again for like staging and so on, right? But what's really nice about this is that that marathon providing sort of those init D um, uh, capabilities, it's, it, if something dies, right, either because it just outright dies, right? Everybody says, oh, my server's going to die, right? Servers don't die that often. But what actually happens is a lot of these in our environment are like VMs, and sometimes the VMs will just die, or they need to do service on the box, and they need to shut it down. And so your, your sort of hardware just comes and goes. And if that's, this happens, Marathon will just kind of figure this out and then go find a new home for the, the, that missing capacity, because it knows it's supposed to have three. So it's kind of a layer above you know, what you typically think of when you're dealing with like Chef and Puppet and kind of dealing with an individual server. Um, it, it's like a layer above that, right? And everybody kind of has to build something like this, right? Um, although there's a lot of work around this, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. All right, so then there's like other steps, right? So we have other um, Jenkins steps that have you know very special purpose slaves that will do things like uh, tests. So you know in this in, in this particular slide, right? I'm showing oh I have this Jenkins job that is probing our service discovery to actually figure out where all those instances got deployed, so I could do something like you know, check and see if the leader election among these three actually was successful, right? Um, or something like that, right? Um, but the idea is to kind of push as much of the unit test, and, you know, to the build step. Uh, but once you start deploying it, start testing the actual running app, right? Other steps are things like the paper, the paperwork that we talked about, right? So uh, if you work in a big company, you probably have a requirement like this where every change requires a change ticket, right? which usually means a trip to the cab, and it's the same day every morning, and you got to get up, and you got to go, please, please, can I deploy my stuff to production, right? That's not DevOps. And it turns out that that's usually something you put in place because it, somebody, somebody put it in place a long time ago. You don't even know why you're doing it, right? And if you actually go ask, like, why do I actually need this ticket? And they say, well, all the, we need this to be recorded, right? And so there, it turns out that unless you're talking about like your financial apps or things like that, they're OK with you not asking permission to deploy your code because it's relatively low risk. And so you can actually flip this around. And instead of your change ticket being asking for permission from humans to basically being an automated record that this thing happened. And so what we do now is when we get to this paper, when we get to the 
if we make it as far as the production deployment, we will look through the commits, we'll pull all the JIRA codes out, we can create a nice rich ticket that says this is everything that went into this. If a person did this, it would say deploy X version 2 to production, please, right? And then you gotta go dig around for all that information. So when, when people are um, you know, scrambling to figure out, oh, what changed, what broke, you now have much more information, right? So at the end of the deployment, let's say it failed, we'd go and we'd go update that ticket, we mark it as it failed and we close the ticket, and now if you wanted to do a new deployment, you basically start all over. If everything was fine, you close the ticket successful, everybody's happy, the, um, the paperwork people got what they needed, you got fast deployment, right? And so, sorry about the eye chart here, but uh, this is basically meant to demonstrate that like, the people is at the beginning, right? And everything else is just kind of automated, right? Um, this is what you want to go for. All right, um, so with 20 environments, we're able now, this is about a 10 minute cycle for us to do this. So I'd say this worked out pretty well for us. Okay, now everybody always asks, well, you know, why didn't you use you know, this, that, or the other thing, right? There's, there's always a big bag of technology that you kind of have to assemble into your platform. Um, everything I showed you here wasn't necessarily the first thing we tried. Um, or necessarily uh, were totally happy with, and everything's replaceable. Um, and so, <clears throat> but there are some technologies, uh, especially around like uh, Docker deployments across like large things that look kind of interesting and are still emerging. Uh, the first is uh, this Kubernetes. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a project open source by Google. It's kind of how they internally manage their sort of pools of containers running across lots of machines. Um, if you're in Google Cloud, it's definitely worth checking out uh, the integrations with all the other um, um, sort of uh, uh, cloud providers as well as private services is still coming. Uh, if you're in Amazon, definitely want to look at the Elastic Container Service. It's actually very similar in a lot of ways to the Mesos stuff, um, although they swear they didn't borrow any of that. Um, the, uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, Docker, the company's uh, doing a lot of great work around uh, Docker Swarm. Uh, there's actually, for instance, like some Docker Swarm to Mesos integration, but um, uh, we're keeping an eye on this because this may actually become sort of the standard API that will replace something like communicating with Marathon across pools of machines for us. Um, although right now, as my understanding is it doesn't do like supervision. If some, so if something dies, it won't restart it. So um, Now, these last two things at the bottom, HashiCorp Vault and Rancher Convoy, I'm, I'm mentioning these because having, somebody always asks me at the end of the talk, like, oh, are these stateful you know, applications or stateless applications? And right now, these are sort of stateless. You saw before, we connect to external data sources. Um, and so the two sort of big gaps right now, I think, um, in sort of, the, sort of the Docker space is a lack of an out-of-band uh, way to pass secrets, right, that database key to your container. Uh, a lot of people use tricks like, oh, well, I'll use Chef encrypted data bags, I'll throw it on the box, and then I'll kind of mount it through a volume. That works. Uh, we do that a little bit. Um, but it's not great, right? Um, and then things, and at some point, we're going to move stateful services in. Rancher Convoy, they just open sourced this. It's basically like, um, this uses the new Docker 1.8 uh, pluggable storage layer stuff so that uh, you can do like volume management in Docker. Um, so I'm looking forward to see what happens with that. Okay, so in conclusion, right? Um, whatever your sort of uh, you know deployment scheme is, however you assemble your your bag of technology, you, you want to take a step back and start with that sort of pipeline, right? How do you get from you know checking code in to production and eliminate all those you know all those steps? Eliminate as many steps as you can. Definitely eliminate all the people steps. Um, the stuff that John was talking about before about you know immutable. Uh, deployments. I, we really kind of love this idea where, you know, if I built it this way in staging but a different way in production with Chef, how do I know I'm actually running the same thing, right? Um, it could be configured completely, completely different. We've had situations like this where something didn't work in prod that worked fine in staging because of a configuration issue, right? Um, so the idea of using Docker to create these repeatable apps using something like Chef to create the repeatable infrastructure, because as great as Docker is, it has to run on something that's been configured. Um, in our case, we configure Mesos and, and things like that. 
as long as all those companion services that it needs. Um, and then using something like Jenkins or pick your favorite sort of pipelining tool that you use. Uh, we were already using Jenkins, uh, which is why we went with that, so that your, your process is repeatable. And it's basically um, as hands-off as possible, right? Um, and then, of course, the sort of the evil uh, configuration that always causes the, the problems, right? Well, what we've tried to uh, get people to do is that if you know it at build time, put it in the Docker container, right? Um, there's, I've always been taught as, as a developer, oh, well, you know, your thread pool size, oh, put that in a property file, right? And pretty soon your property file has 80 bazillion things in it, and it becomes unmanageable. I'm not going to change that from release to release. So you want to just bake that right into your, your Docker container, your Amazon image, or however you're doing your, your image-based deployments. Um, all the other things that are actually different from environment to environment, like connect to this database in staging, connect to this database in production, pass those in as parameters uh, at launch time. If you need to change it, you reboot, right? For the first one, if you need to change that thread pool size or whatever, make a new Docker image. It's easy, right? Um, and then for things that are sort of outside of environment and um, sort of known and compile time concerns, things like, oh, what's the current exchange rate, right? Move those to external uh, services, either data sources or something like a console or an SCD or Zookeeper, right? Pick your favorite. There's lots of them. Um, because you don't want to put this off too long, right? You're going to start with one app. We started with one app. And pretty soon you're going to have hundreds if you're successful. Um, you don't want... To, you don't want your process like beating you over the head as time goes on, right? You want to you want to tackle this early, right? So don't put this off. Um, and with that, that's all I got. So I think I got what like three minutes for questions. Yeah, and we'll pass the mic around. Be kind. When you have, hello, that's loud. When you have um, hundreds of uh, endpoints and hundreds of servers behind that, and then of course you have to multiply it for redundancy and multiple data centers, you end up with thousands and thousands of nodes that you have to, how do you avoid like being beaten to death by monitoring and automation on, all, on thousands of nodes? Because I'm hitting the same thing. We have hundreds of endpoints. The developers have become addicted to every new service has its own endpoint and cluster. And so. Yeah. Um, OK, so ooh, that's a good question. So yeah, most of what I talked about here is mostly around like the deployment stuff. Obviously, the monitoring and, um, is, is very, very important. Um, so. There's some stuff that like we use that, at, during the deployment cycle, like the health endpoints, to see whether or not it's successful or healthy or not. But you could get in a point where, you know, like in this particular case, you have Marathon kind of watching everything. So for the most part, it will like restart things. So most of those things that you like catastrophic failures would be dealt with automatically. But there are the most of the devils in the ones that are still okay. But they're really, really slow. And yeah, you do need to watch for those. In, in our particular world, what we do is um, all the applications emit metrics to a central location. It's basically graphite. Um, we are in the process of revamping that to run it through like a, a um, sort of a Kafka storm kind of thing so that we can do um, you know, more processing on it in, in real time and actually react to it faster. But for the most part, it's, it's some combination of setting up um, a place for all these metrics to go, then you have to sort of create these sort of different views, right? There's, is the site broken, you know, kind of view that is at the very highest level. Then you want sort of the teams to be watching their stuff, right? Because at some point you do have more things than eyeballs can look at. And, I, I have to play and you still don't want, and you still don't want the eyeballs on it. Eventually you want, you know, you want to be able to query your, your you know, uh, time series database or whatever and say, when this is above this, alert somebody or do something or re restart something. Um, that's really the goal. But you, you, have to, you have to be able to spread the pain um, so that, because as a developer, you know, if your stuff is broken all the time in production, you probably just don't know it, right? Um, because breaking the site, that's what you hear about, right? You don't hear about the stuff that, 
oh, your, your application is throwing errors every three seconds, but it's not impairing the site. As a developer, you could still go fix that, right? It doesn't require all hands, but it does require that you, you create that, feed, that feedback loop, right? Yeah. There's tons of good, good stuff in there for open space. Other questions? All right. Well, I'll be around uh, if you want to ask me later. We got, we got one more question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Hi, my question was more about the process to go from what you had before to this. How long did that take? How many team members? What was the collaboration like? Um, so for this particular experiment, as you saw, we kind of extracted the stuff behind the existing services. So the entire rest of the system was exactly the same, right? So nobody really even knew we were doing this. Um, and there was that moment where somebody's like, you're not doing it like all the other stuff, right? Um, you're creating this potential Pandora's box, right, of now we're going to have two things. And uh, that, did have, that did actually happen. Uh, the actual collaboration was maybe the de between uh, development operations was maybe like uh, two people in operations and maybe like six developers. And we just kind of decided, we just kind of went back and forth and figured out. We're going to pick this, that, and the other thing, try it out, and just keep, kept iterating on it until we found something that worked. Um, but at some point, when it became, um, well, this is in production. This is a real thing. Uh, they actually, the developers, actually went and had all those conversations with security and change management to sort of make sure that any and all of their concerns were, were sort of dealt with for this particular application, right? Um, and so now this approval chain became a one-time thing, right? If you create a new application, they want to know, you know, what's, what's the impact if it uh, occurs? Is it, it going to be a huge financial impact if this occurs? What, what's the website going to look like? Um, once you've addressed all of that, they're OK with you just kind of doing these continuous deployments because they know what you're doing. They know what the, the, the scope is, right? Um, did that answer your question? OK. Yeah, there's there's a lot to unpack in seeding and catalyzing organizational cultural change. So yeah. that can be an open space too. Let's thank Steve. Nice. Thanks, guys.